He was raised in Palos Heights, Illinois, and attended Brother Rice High School. He became the first U.S.-born native son to be drafted in the first round by his hometown team, the Chicago Blackhawks. He played in the NHL for 16 seasons, totaling roughly 1,000 games and almost 800 career points. In 1994, he raised Lord Stanley's Cup as a member of the New York Rangers. 2003 to 2005, he served as the head coach of the Pittsburgh Penguins. Currently, he's the color commentator for the NHL on NBC and for the Chicago Blackhawks on Comcast Sportsnet and WGN. And ironically, his birthday falls on Arlington Million Day this summer. And Eddie, Arlington Park, nice enough to let us use their paddock for this interview, a place that obviously is near and dear to your heart. Yes, it is, Joe. Always good to see you, and thanks a lot for having me. Uh, spent uh, many a days as a young kid, uh, whether I grew up in uh, the south side in Palos Heights or Growing up in Niles, I uh, got a chance to get out to old Arlington Park, but now getting a chance to come back home over the years, and it's always a great day to, uh, to spend at the races here at Arlington. Well, the first question is an obvious one. How did you get your initial interest, obviously, coming here as a kid, but who brought you, and yeah. why was it exciting to you? Well, I think for me it was kind of just coming uh, with a friend of mine, uh, another former hockey player that lived in the area, and uh, just came out to the races one day, and... You know, you look at the racing form and, you know, it gets a little intimidating every once in a while. But, uh, you know, once you kind of start learning and uh, understanding the game and uh, knowing the horses and knowing the jocks, for me, it just became uh, a passion and love uh, even when I was, you know, 13, 14 years old. But then as I got a little bit older and all of a sudden I had a job in the National Hockey League, I started having a few more bucks in my pocket. And, <laughs> and Denny Savard was one guy that I kind of palled around with, not only because of our passion for the great game of hockey and being members of the Blackhawks family, but also two guys that liked, uh, liked the racetrack and, and loved the action. And uh, so I think it really kind of started once I turned pro and then getting involved in ownership, which is great and have been on and off over the years. But for me, it just started as a young kid coming to the track one day and enjoying it and kind of learning about the game. Well, it was a great picture of you with the Stanley Cup <laughs> back at Nick Zito's barn yeah. with Gopher Gin. Yeah. Now, did you cash a ticket at 9-1? to one? <laughs> That was kind of a trade-off where he got the sip from the cup? Or? Yeah, no, no, I did not cash a ticket that year. Uh, but I did cash on July 1st, 1994, when I was able to, uh, to bring the Stanley Cup out to Belmont Park. Uh, really, it all started the day before, Joel, where uh, I got the cup delivered to my house and, uh, in New York and uh, went out to the Meadowlands racetrack. Had a little private party there up in the Pegasus room, which is a beautiful room at the Meadowlands. And then the next day, we brought the Stanley Cup out to Belmont Park. We put it at the finish line, and uh, people made donations to the Horseman's Benevolent Fund that day. And uh, the Stanley Cup stood at the, at the finish line for about eight hours, and uh, I think they raised over $20,000 that day, which was, which was great. But before that, I got a chance to go and meet Nick and, uh, and meet Gopher Gin uh, and to have that picture, and that picture sits... Uh, uh, proudly on my on my desk at home, and uh, it's hard to believe that it's been 20 years uh, that 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 happened. Uh, but to get a chance to have what I think is the greatest trophy in all the sports, to be with a Kentucky Derby winner in 1994 is something I'll never forget. Now you talked about learning the game and coming out here as a kid and learning the racing form and the trainers and the jockeys. How has it all played into what kind of horse player you are today? Mm -hmm. What are some of the most important factors that you uh, you look at? Well, I, I think condition and class of race to me is, is where, I, where I start right away. Um, and then, you know, we've talked a lot about it, Joel, over the years. I mean, pace certainly makes the race. Uh, I wasn't a big believer in bias, track bias. But over the last handful of years, I've, I've become more into that. And I believe it is daily. I, I don't think uh, it's something where you can say that, uh, over a course of four or five days that a track is playing. So I, I do believe it does change. Uh, one thing I would like to know is just like when horses become geldings for the first time, I would like to see that noted in the form or the program. Uh, and also what, what are they doing? What is the track maintenance? Not only here at Arlington, but throughout North America, because I think that uh, the people that are getting their feet wet and the handicappers need to have that information. But for, but for me, I think it is class condition. I think it's pace of the race. Uh, and, uh, and, and just kind of seeing, you know, where things might map out for the first half a mile and then kind of figuring out where to go from there. And, and sometimes it's, uh, I wonder if I really know what I'm doing on a particular day, 
but then there's all other days sometimes where it just kind of all comes together and uh, and it works out the way that you would like but you know the one thing Joe and you, and you bring that up and, and it's the one thing that I have and, and I try to be a spokesperson unofficially for the game whether I'm doing the games on local TV here with the great Hall of Famer the great Pat Foley or I'm doing the games nationally on NBC uh, with the great Doc Emmerich but like to me I, I think that people need to understand about horse racing is that you know you're just not wagering against the house the house gets its cut you're wagering against the guy sitting next to you upstairs here at Arlington or somebody that's sitting in a at the Red Rock Resort in Las Vegas uh, it's a lot of people think in the outside people that I come across with Joe in the hockey world is is that well you know you're playing against the house no you're not right. and I think we need to do a better job in horse racing and say look you know you're, you're playing against a guy that's sitting in an OTB in, in, in Fargo uh, you know, in, in Fargo and North Dakota, or, or you're sitting in Las Vegas, or somebody sitting across the street. So that that's the one thing that I, I try to continue to tell people is that you know you're playing against the guy next to you, you're playing against your buddies, and I think that's what makes our game so great. But for me, it's about condition, it's class, it's the pace, and uh, and really kind of seeing how the particular track is playing on a particular day. And it has to be your day, and you mentioned how things can sometimes go your way when you're playing the horses. Mm -hmm. Let me take you back about five years ago. <laughs> Pick six, yeah. 500,000. I believe yeah. the ticket cost you 166 bucks. Yeah. We both know that handicapping is a big part of the game, but the way you construct the ticket right. and maximize your money is also a big part of the game. Not a bad return on investment yeah. that day for you. No, it was one of the more exciting uh, days or couple of days that I had had. Uh, Oddly enough, Joe, I was in Las Vegas for the NHL awards, and the day before I blew the pick six at Hollywood, it, it, I just it was a bad, it was a bad play on my part. There was a first time gelding I should have used, I didn't, and it cost me the pick six, five of six. But we traveled home uh, the next day, and that it was a Friday night, and uh, they had night racing at Hollywood Park, which is no longer with us, uh, unfortunately and sadly, because I've had some of my best days at Hollywood Park. But uh, we were on an airplane, and I had handicapped the whole time. And we were scheduled to get in about, you know, 9 o'clock or so from Las Vegas. And I was with my son, uh, Thomas, who, who, who went out to the awards with me. And we were delayed, we were delayed, we were delayed. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, we land, like, at about 9.45. So I got on my phone. I, I called in my pick six. It took us an hour and a half for baggage. I went home. I had my youngest son tape it on uh, I'm old school, so on the VCR. So I had the VCR <laughs> in the machine, taping the first couple of legs of the pick six at Hollywood. I got back in to see like leg, like leg uh, race six, seven, and eight, and then I went back and watched the first couple of legs. But um, sure enough, I got lucky. I was I keyed a 17 to one shot right in the middle, and then uh, I spread a couple uh, uh, the next couple of races, and then I had seven of the nine horses in the last race, and actually on three of the horses I had the whole pool if those horses would have ended up winning but for me that was uh, it all came together uh, the long long day of handicapping but it was just one of those days Joe where I I should have hit it the day before and I kicked myself in the rear end for not having it and uh, the best part about that is is I was watching the races and you know and again it, it, that was like 10 45 10 50 at night here in Chicago with the last race going off at Hollywood or maybe even later than that, and Joel Quinville, the uh, Blackhawks' great head coach and, and two-time Stanley Cup winner, is, is a is a big horse guy. I'm alive and I'm trying to share it with anybody that I can. And I pick up the I pick up my phone and I call Joel, and Joel's on the East Coast at this time. And without a beta breath, Joel answers the phone, and he sees it's my number, and he goes, "Are you alive?" <laughs> That's awesome. So there's a typical horse player, uh, and, and sure enough, and Joel said, "Well, you know, the ten horse is going to win," and sure enough, the ten horse won. But for me, the key was is you know money management for sure, and having a stand on a horse that I thought can come off the pace. Neil French was a trainer, and uh, seventeen to one got me through the middle leg, and from then on, I kind of felt pretty confident that I was going to hit it. I had no idea when you look at how it broke down. There was a four to five that won the first leg, and then it was a seven to two. A seven to two, my seventeen to one, a nine to two, and then a five to one. So when you look at it and you, and you break it down, you go, boy, it shouldn't have paid this, but I'm glad it paid what it did. And as I told everybody, every squirrel finds a nut, and I got back to even. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. We won't talk about where you've gone since then. But Eddie, um, you know, you put in the preparation. Yeah. But you come to the racetrack, albeit Arlington, where a lot of people know you. Yeah. Every five feet, someone stops you. They want to talk to you. They want to take a picture. 
there's a social way to enjoy the game, but also a way where you really put in the preparation and you really try to attack a card yeah. and make some money. Yeah. How do you maintain that balance when you come out to the yeah. track live? Well, usually before uh, I would ever get to the track, Joel, is that I would have pretty much my handicapping done well before that. Like I, I, I'm, I'd become better, I believe. Uh, like last year, I'll, just, I'll use this as an example, and I was lucky enough to be a part of the coverage on, on good old Channel 9 with the Arlington Million, mm -hmm. uh, is, is working with Howard and, and, and Howard Sudbury and, and Dan Rohn, but is I've become more confident, it's probably a better way to put it, on looking at horses and, 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 and seeing how they look and how they appear. It was like last year, I just thought the, the Apache looked absolutely incredible in the paddock, in the post parade, and he wasn't my pick to win, but I had him on my ticket just because of the class that he was running with. And it was just one of those things. And of course he won and got DQ'd and rightfully so. But for me, I think, you know, seeing horses and seeing how they're acting plays a little bit more part. But for me, most of my work is done the, the night or the morning before. So when I get a chance to come out and look, I, I, I think I'm a people person. I, I love being a part of what I do representing the Blackhawks on a daily basis and also representing the horse racing game. And, you know, I get a chance to come out here and, and, and see the races and in my travels and my work schedule, sometimes I'm just, I'm not able to do that. And uh, I do have to be at home every once in a while and, <laughs> uh, with four kids and my beautiful wife, Diana, mm -hmm. who's been married almost 26 years now. So, you know, there's that level, but I, I love coming out the track. There's nothing like being out here and getting that so-called in-game experience. But for me, for the majority of the time, my handicapping's pretty much done. Uh, before I get to the track. Well, Eddie, we mentioned your accomplishments as a broadcaster, and what a lot of people don't know is you actually got your first job and cut your teeth without ever having been on TV before in horse racing. Why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, back in 1994, we just won the Cup with the New York Rangers, and uh, we ended up, unfortunately, having a work stoppage uh, the next season uh, where the NHL shut down for five or six months, and... Uh, people over at the Meadowlands Racetrack where I had brought the Stanley Cup for that private party to, to celebrate. Um, Hal Handel, Bruce Garland, Jimmy Gagliano, Chris McElaine, uh, they were all hockey fans and they knew my passion for the game and they thought, well, geez, if you're not working as a hockey player, maybe you want to work in the horse racing part. And sure enough, they brought me over to the Meadowlands Racetrack for the Thoroughbreds and I worked as a, uh, an in-house uh, race analyst for the uh, for the races at the Meadowlands. I worked with Barbara Foster, who was my partner, and that was my introduction to television. Uh, it was in horse racing back in the fall of 1994, and uh, look, I had a job to come to the racetrack. I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. I wasn't allowed to play hockey, so it gave me a chance to come to the, to the Meadowlands and do that, but I really got a chance to appreciate how hard it is to, uh, you know, to kind of be on this side of the camera and talk about it and and feel comfortable. So I really got my uh, I got my opportunity in television as being a an analyst at the Meadowlands Racetrack for Thoroughbreds back in 1994, and I can't believe this. I mean, it's it's 20 years, and now it's my living as as a hockey guy uh, doing it on the uh, the broadcast side, whether it's for the Blackhawks or NBC. Was it true they paid you in a voucher? <laughs> Yes, a couple of days I, I had vouchers and they were pretty smart because they knew those vouchers were not going in the pocket, they were going into the machine. And yes, they had vouchers 20 years ago. Yes, they did. So let's talk about the broadcasting then. Obviously, you're not afraid to talk about horse racing on the broadcasts. Yeah. Um, why do you think that horse racing is a little bit taboo when it comes to um, high profile people, athletes? I'm surprised more athletes don't own horses. Uh -huh. They have disposable income. Right. It's competitive. There's yeah. ego involved. All things that sure. you know, personify an athlete. Why do you think it's not more mainstream within that uh, that arena? Yeah, I mean, I think that you know there there are some so-called high-profile people that are in the ownership aspect of it. Uh, you know, I know Rick Pitino is involved. Mm -hmm. Wes Welker, I know, was involved, just to name two guys that come to the top of my head, and I know I'm missing probably, you know, 25, 30 other people that are, are in, in these, you know, in, in sports, in sports profession or college level or whatever. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think that, you know, again, we need to do um, horse racing. We need to do a better job is to maybe explain the game and to understand that, hey, look, it's just not about 
how much money you have in your pocket. I mean, look at the run that California Chrome right. went on. It, it isn't, it isn't about that. But to me, like the money part of it is important for sure because there are a lot of things that come into owner ownership into, into owning, uh, you know, one of the greatest animals that there are. But it's the camaraderie. It's the understanding that, and what what I appreciate and love about the game so much is that when I get a chance to go back to the to the backside. In, in owning a horse now with Tammy Domanowski, who's had an unbelievable meet here in Arlington, has been great for me, is to be able to go back to her barn in the mornings and to see all the hard work going on by the hot walkers and the, and the grooms people and the job that she does and the exercise riders. To me, that's what makes the game go. Mm-hmm. And I see the same thing as when I played hockey, Joe, for as long as I did and now having a hand in it at the TV level is the the people behind the scenes, the trainers, uh, the physicians, the doctors, uh, you know, the, the front office people. Um, th- that's, th- that's the part that I really appreciate. It all comes together here in the afternoon when the crowd shows up and the jocks show up and the trainers are there front and center, the horses are there. But there's so much hard work that goes in behind the scenes is that's where I get the true appreciation. Like, if you told me if I had a choice, either come out to the races in the afternoon or go back on the backside if you said you only have you only can do one thing mm-hmm. for one week i think if you would ask tammy right now i think she would she would guarantee now maybe she wants me to get away from the mornings <laughs> but i would say is i i would want to go back in the mornings because you get a chance you see people you you know i mean you see the jocks i saw jimmy graham you see uh it's, i saw manny the other day you know what i mean you just see people and and uh and that's what i i love about it but i think long-winded to your question is that i, I think that you know, maybe we need to hustle a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Maybe we need to, you know, to show people and, 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 and just tell them, look, it just isn't about how much money you have, but this is all what comes with it. And, um, but there are a lot of people out there that, uh, uh, you know, that are in. I know Chris Collinsworth as well, Sunday night, uh, football night in America on NBC. I know he's part ownership in a couple of horses. Al Michaels as well. So, you know, there are a lot of people out there that, that, that do, maybe not on a, on a big name basis. But it's, it's important to, to maybe we do a better job of going out there and hustling and soliciting uh, people like that and, and teach them about the game. And look, you can have a, as much fun with a five claimer as you could with, right. a, you know, with an allowance horse. But uh, it's, 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 a good, it's a good valid point by you, and it's up to people like us to continue to, to sell the game. You mentioned Tammy Dominoski as your trainer. Right. Talk about the comparisons and contrasts, the differences between a trainer mm-hmm. and a head coach. Mm-hmm. A lot of trainers will try to jam horses in when, sure. when strike when the iron's hot, try right. to win races. Right. Other trainers are more, you know, meticulous mm-hmm. and take their time. Yeah. Same with coaches. Yeah. Great regular season doesn't right, equate right. Yeah. to a great playoff run. Right. So yeah. talk to me about the differences and the, the, the similarities. Yeah, well, I think the coaching to the training aspect is, is that you got to have a feel. I, I really do. And look, and I coached for a couple of years in, in Pittsburgh, uh, uh, and I got a, a real good sense of that. And, you know, when you're a player, you got to worry about one thing, Joe, and that's yourself. As a coach, you got to worry about the 23 players, the 23 egos, and, and everything else that goes with it. And, and I think the coaching aspect is, is that, and I think this is changing, but I think this is more old guard is like, well, this guy can't do this, and he can't do this, and this this horse can't run here and he can't run. Well, then look it, he's in my barn, he's in my locker room. What can he do? What can she do? And then it's up to the coach or the trainer to put him in that spot and to, to have success. And really, and really that's what it is. I mean, it's a, it's a, as a coach, you're, you're a manager of, of people. And I don't think it's any different in the training, in the training aspect of it. And, and, and our buddy, Jim Miller pointed me to Tammy and, uh, it's, it's been great. I, she's been, uh, overly helpful. Um, she manages a, a big barn. She's a people person, and uh, she's had a, a great run here to start at Arlington. But I think that similarities of, of, of having patience and, and understanding that, look, we're all in this to win. You know, we're not in this to, to hit the board. We're all in this to win. And I think the understanding is that you got to run your horses. you got to play your players where they're going to have success. Right. So I think that, to me, is when if you're, a good, if you're a good manager of people or animals, is that you're going to have uh, you're going to have a lot of success? But uh, Tammy's been uh, a pleasure to be around, and uh, she did an unbelievable job with uh, Lavender Patch, who we claimed a couple of months ago, and and just managing her. And, and Fidel, who's uh, who's the groom for for Lavender Patch, is just 
kind of the trust factor. You know, she 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 really wouldn't trust anybody when for when for she first got here from Turfway to Arlington, but Tammy uh, done a, a remarkable job to to be able to earn that trust, and it's a lot of fun. And you know, I, I enjoy going back there, and I think she knows where my passion is on a daily basis when I come out to the track and try not to be in the way, but certainly uh, you know be a part of uh, of what she has going. And she's got a lot of really good owners, and she's got off to a great start. So a lot of similarities when you talked about the people in charges, and I tell her, look, you're the boss. I'm going to have a say regardless because, you know what, I write the checks, right. but you're the boss. I want to know what's going on and, uh, and have that communication, and she certainly does that. All right, so another comparison, hockey and horse racing, two sports that are trying to become even more popular. Yeah. So off camera we talked about the possibility of you, mm -hmm. which has now become reality, sure. doing more broadcasting for horse racing yeah. on a bigger stage, yeah. which will bring – hockey fans to say, hey, wow, Eddie thinks horse racing is cool. Right. We, you know, what's this all about? I think that's great for the game, so tell us about your new gig. Yeah, well, I, it's been something I've pounded the pavement here for the last handful of years being a part of NBC's family. And, and you know, look at NBC has the NHL, and I, and I think that we do a really good job not only on, the, on uh, over the air on good old Channel 5 here in Chicago, but also on the cable side on NBCSN, but also NBC and NBCSN is where you go for national horse racing for the mm -hmm. most part. And, you know, over the years, I've, you know, anytime that there's the Derby promos or the Belmont or the Preakness or getting ready for, ready, ready for the Breeders' Cup, uh, my great partner, Doc Emmerich, always, you know, he always lets me read the promo. And, I mean, I think the energy aspect of it is try to sell the game. And I think over the years, I just wanted to become a part of it. And, look, you get lucky every once in a while. You know, you have Super Saver and then you give out the uh, – you know, you give out uh, Gold and Soul and, and Orb, and you give out the Trifecta and the Exacta and the Derby a couple of years ago. Oxbow was my sleeper in the Preakness a couple of years ago. Union Rags, and then you have the other ones like Vickers in Trouble, where I think I think he's still running in the in the uh, in the uh, in the Derby this year. But it's a lot of fun, and you know, you got to take the good with the bad. Right. And, and I finally got an opportunity, and it looks like it's going to come fruition that I'm going to be a part of the. Uh, you know, the racing series on NBCSN and NBC this summer, and I'm going to get a chance to be a part of the coverage. Uh, going to do the Gold Cup out at, uh, at uh, Santa Anita, the Hollywood Gold Cup now at Santa Anita. Going to be a part of the Haskell coverage, and I'm going to get two opportunities at Saratoga, I think, for the Whitney and Travers. So I think NBC does a great job. I just want to become a part of the family and, and, and talk about what I know and nothing more, nothing less. And uh, I'm thrilled that I'm going to get that opportunity because, as you know, Joe, it's – it's something that I've, I'm, I'm passionate about. I, I take great pride in, and I'm looking forward to being part of it. So uh, I'm, I'm excited. I'm a little nervous, but uh, it'll be a lot of fun. And, and, yes, the pressure will be on for sure. What would I rather have, to have to pick the, uh, the winner of the Gold Cup or to have that puck on my stick in overtime? <laughs> now, of course, you know, that pressure of going in overtime. Uh, but everybody's got an opinion, and I think that's what makes it so great. So I'm, I'm really fortunate. My boss, Sam Flight at NBC, has given me that chance. And, and Rob Hyland is a producer, mm -hmm. and Billy Matthews. So those guys, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of stuff over the, you know, I've been doing some talkbacks with Lafitte, right. Lafitte Pinkai uh, Jr., and, uh, and I did a, actually a hit uh, during the Belmont uh, with Bob Costas on the big show, which was great. So um, and I'm, your I'm looking forward Express to it. Bed commercial. Yeah, well, you know, uh, lucky enough to have that uh, opportunity, and it's, look at, and you ask anybody, you can ask my kids, and I'll tell you <laughs> probably half the truth, but. I'm not very good with the computer. I'm not very good with the social part of it. But the one thing I can do is I can't get my feet wet. I can't get my feet wet on expressbed.com. And for me, that's how I hit the pick six. Got on the phone, made right the on. call, and, and we're all happy. So, uh, yeah. But, I, you know, like I said, I, I try to promote the game in the most positive light. And look at there's always, always going to people that are going to question and doubt, but that's like that in every walk of life. And I lived it as an American-born hockey player cracking into the National Hockey right. League. So uh, I enjoy the challenge, and I will continue to do that regardless if I'm on the big stage or I'm sitting in my uh, couch in Long Grove uh, watching the races like I usually do. Now the hat trick of things that you love, family, hockey, horse racing. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your family a little bit. Your wife, Diana, you have three sons, you have a daughter. Yeah. How does it all play in with their interest level in hockey, mm -hmm. with you being a famous hockey dad? Mm -hmm. And now your interest, which is huge in horse racing, yeah. are they uh, interested in that at all too? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, my boys all still play competitive hockey. Uh, my daughter tried it at a very young age, and she just, you know, I don't think she wanted to ruin her nails or whatever, and which was, <laughs> which was okay with me. And she's a, she's a sophomore at Alabama, so for me, 
Uh, hockey's always been our life. Uh, hockey has always interrupted family time, but, you know, we understand that, and uh, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Like, that's the one thing I'm, I'm most proud of is, is that uh, my family. Uh, I've been married to my wife, Diana, for 26 years coming up. We've been together almost 30 years coming up, which, I, I, which I, it's really hard to believe for me. But we have uh, four healthy kids. Uh, can't forget our dog, Holly, a Labrador as well. And uh, we're very lucky. Everything we have, we owe to the game of hockey. But I think they know my passion for horse racing over the years. You know, whether it was me playing in Toronto and owning horses up at Woodbine, you know, my wife would come to the track with me, and she might probably be eight months pregnant, and there we would be with, uh, with Mike Mattini, who's still training out there uh, at, at Woodbine and sitting in a winner's picture with Regal Ravage or, uh, you know, uh, going to the tracks at Santa Anita or going to Belmont when we were in New York or going to Cinnaboya Downs in Winnipeg where I played almost six years of my career. So the horse racing part has always been a big part of it. You know, I think my kids like horse racing, but they're not into it as much mm -hmm. as I am. But I think they understand it's a passion for me. It's a release for me when I'm not doing the, the hockey, uh, you know, the hockey aspect of it. But you know, they came out the other day when uh, when Lavender Patch ran in her last race, and it was great to have my family here and, and supporting that aspect of it. And I think they really appreciate the game and know the hard work that goes into it. And uh, but it'll always be a part of it. And, I mean, you come into our house. There's pictures of horses, there's pictures of winter circles, there's pictures of the horses eating out of the Stanley Cup. I mean, whatever it is, it's, it's either hockey or horses, but uh, I'm very proud of, of what we do have, and, and the game has brought me so much. And look, to be able to work for the Blackhawks like I do, mm -hmm. uh, Joe, and to work for a team that I grew up idolizing and, and living and dying with uh, my whole life is great to be able to be at home, and uh, I, I take great pride in, in, in everything that I do. But uh, my family is uh, is kind of the, is, has been the backbone of everything that I do. Now, obviously, you know you were inducted into the United States Hockey mm -hmm. Hall of Fame. The Blackhawks did a great tribute for mm -hmm. you. Uh, it was very emotional. Yeah. It was fantastic to watch. I know yeah. it kind of brought a tear to your eye sure. a little bit. Yeah. The fans love you. The organization. It's it's been uh, synergetic throughout yeah. the years. Um, you have a legacy. You have a legacy as a player. Now you're building your legacy as a broadcaster. Let's talk about legacy in general. Even in horse racing, horses build legacies. Sure. Trainers and jockey, mm -hmm. they build legacies too. How important is the legacy you leave behind? You know, it's a, it's a great question. I, I've never been asked that before, believe it or not, Joe. Um, I would want people if they heard my name or they knew me as to say, you know what? He's the same guy he was when he was a rookie in the NHL or he was a broadcaster uh, at the highest level or he's running in a five claimer at Arlington or at Hawthorne. Um, is that I like to think I've been the same person and, and I, I've always tried to make people feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I learned this a long time ago from my dad is the true colors of someone or some team or some organization or some sport isn't when things are great, but when things are tough. I think that's when you show your true character. So I, I'd like to think that people would, you know, remember me or, or think of me as being somebody that was personable and somebody that was real passionate about the game and understood the role that I had in the community and the society and not only with hockey, but of course in horse racing. And, um, but I, you know, you, I just try to be, try to be a good person every day and, and, and make people feel good about themselves. and. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, I think it just—it's—it's it's about family too. Is that you know, there's a day go by that you know I don't tell my wife or my kids that I love them, or my mom and dad. Mm -hmm. You know, I still embrace my dad with a hug and a kiss, and uh, you know, something might not be the proper thing nowadays, but that's how I grew up. And just because I'm—I don't say I'm an old guy now at 47, but you know, I'm getting—I'm getting up there. Is that you know, I can, you know, regardless if it's in our own house or amongst four or five hundred people, is that I can acknowledge my family that way and. Uh, but I would want people to think that I was the same guy, uh, you know, before I made it to the National Hockey League, and now after everything that's kind of gone on, is that I'm the same person. Now we talk about legacies and legacies in horse racing, and we almost had a Triple Crown yeah, winner yeah. this year. Tell us your thoughts about the Triple Crown in general this year, how it all played out. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of drama. Sure. We almost had a Triple Crown winner. We've almost had one yeah, several right, times exactly. now in the yeah. last 20 years. Yeah. But your thoughts on this year's Triple Crown run, mm -hmm. And then the Triple Crown in general. Yeah. Well, I think any time that you can get two for two and, and get into that last leg at the Belmont, I, it, it's great for the game. 
uh, non-horse racing people talk about it a lot more. It's front and center, which is great for the game. And you're right. It was the 13th time now that we've had it. I think summer 12 or 13, yeah. whatever it is. I mean, to, to be that close, it's going to happen. I, I believe it's going to happen. It's going to take some luck. Now, unfortunately, California Chrome didn't have much luck uh, coming out of the uh, starting gate at the Belmont and the trip. And then, you know, you can you want to dissect the ride, you know, as a horse racing guy. You know, I didn't think it was the greatest ride, but it was a tough trip. Everybody's gunning for California Chrome. Horse has nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, that day, it just wasn't his day. And look, we've seen it. We saw it in game seven between the Blackhawks and Kings. Yeah. It wasn't their day. A bounce here. You know, all of a sudden, you know, you're out. You're out. Um, I think it, it's tremendous for the game, the stories that happen. Uh, I know it's going to happen, uh, and I can't wait to, uh, to see it happen. But it does take a special horse. Now, if you're asking me, would you like to see the races spread out? You know, would you, would you like to see some changes? You know, maybe, you know, maybe. But how will that affect history? Well, my argument to that would be, Joe, is that we have changes in all sports, right. whether it's from how tight, uh, you know, how tight the, uh, you know, the leather is on a football, you know, the seams, the baseball. Uh, Offsides rules and hockey. Offsides and rules, not yeah. as much hooking and holding. You know, you could go on and on, and there's always been those tweaks. So are we in for that aspect of it? Maybe. Um, how would that affect history? Well, I guess you can look at other sports and, and make that same argument. Um, but I, I think it's great that any time that we can be in the running for, uh, for a Triple Crown uh, and California Chrome has nothing to be uh, ashamed about because he gave everything that he had and unfortunately just came up a little short and didn't have that luck that we all know we need on a, on a yeah. daily basis. And it should make your broadcast leading up to the Breeders' Cup hopefully that much more interesting because Horse racing, like any sport, it's all about the storylines. It's all about getting people interested, yeah. having them relate to something, and then seeing what the outcome is. Yeah. Well, I think it's a perfect example. Is I mean, you know, I mean, look at Game On, dude, right? I mean, still running, still near the top of his uh -huh. game. But for me, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of those horses. I mean, we know the reason that a lot of times horses stop. I mean, look, injuries most importantly, but you know. People want to get the horses to the breeding shed and, and, and move on with that next stage. But it's important, you hit it right on the head, is to be able to tell those stories and to be able for people to be able to relate right. and go, wow, you got a six or seven year old here still running. And you know, even though he may only run th three or four times a year, is that he's running at the highest handicap levels and, and it, it, makes it, it makes it really fun. And, and you know, it's just, I really believe is, you know, to relate it to is that, look, when you have Unbelievable athletes. I mean, a Tim Duncan being able to play like he did and win a championship at that age level. I mean, what is, you know, there really is no difference of, of, of a horse uh, like Wise Dan or, uh, or Game On Do that, you know, yeah, is on the back nine and is probably on the 18 tee box. And, but they're still running at the All highest right. level and have a chance to win, you know, the, the ultimate, you know, in, in the Breeders' Cup. And, uh, but that, to me, is what makes it so so great and, uh, and to be a, a part of it as a fan, most importantly. Because I always be a fan whether I'm working or not um, and whether I have any action or not. I'm always going to be a fan of the game. Well, Edzo, this interview has been tremendously <laughs> tremendous. And I have a parting gift for you. I know you weren't able to make it to bum out yourself. <laughs> Don't worry. There's a lot more where those came from. Yes, I know. But I did say, I did say is that California Chrome was not going to get any of my money that day. And I didn't have the stones enough to say he wasn't going to hit the board. Because I really thought, though, Joe, I really thought in the Preakness, I really thought the last 16th of a mile, he was really, I don't say, I, I think I said earlier in the day on NBC, I said, I don't want to say he was spinning his wheels, but I didn't see that same acceleration uh -huh. and finish. Now, did that have anything to do with in the Belmont? I'm not sure. But uh, he didn't get any of my money. I did use him in gimmicks. <laughs> Uh, and unfortunately, that day I hit five of six in the pick six, and sadly enough, I got beat by Mott's horse. Uh, close hatches uh, beat me by you know what a five of six. So I'm going to try to get that other one in at some point here and get back to where I was about four or five years ago. But I'll put this on the mantle with the other like 10,000 tickets I have in the house. All right, well, very good. I really well, appreciate a lot. it. Anytime, always great to see you and keep up the great work. In the spotlight, Eddie Olchek.